Hey, hi! Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, I'm a programmer at TIFF now, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Jared Moshe, a writer, director, and producer whose films include Dead Man's Burden and The Ballad of Lefty Brown. His latest is Aporia, a quietly brilliant time travel drama starring Judy Greer as Sophie, a recently widowed mom given a chance to get her late husband back through his best friend's impossible invention, only to have to confront the ethical and practical consequences of that choice. It's opening in theaters across North America this Friday, August 11th, and you should go see it. Jared picked The Full Monty, Peter Cataneo's 1997 sleeper about a group of -of out-of-work men in Sheffield who decide to mount a burlesque review, partly to make some quick cash, and partly because there's nothing else to do. And once they start down that road, they not only bond as friends, but gain a whole new perspective on masculinity and self-confidence. A massive international hit that considerably boosted the profiles of Robert Carlyle, Tom Wilkinson, and particularly Mark Addy, the film kicked off a wave of plucky British cinema that continues to this day and proved a life-changing experience for the young Jared. I'll let him explain. This is someone else's movie. So I love The Full Monty. Uh, It was one of those movies that I didn't really know what to expect when I saw it. I saw it when I was probably about 17 or 18. Okay. And um, it was just when I was kind of getting into like really loving indie film and trying to see everything I could see. Um, And I knew it was about male strippers, but what I think I didn't remember connecting with so much was how deep the characterizations were and how much this was like this aspirational, uplifting movie that was hilarious. I mean, it's so funny, Um, but it hits you in the heart in a way that I was very unexpected. And it dealt with like these men struggling with masculinity, which I, um, I don't know, I was a teenager. So maybe that I didn't quite understand it, but I could understand like what they were going through a little bit. And I was intrigued by it. Um, and so, you know, as I saw it in theaters and then I remember I had a VHS on it, like when it, when we, recorded it. And I, it was one of my go-to when I went to college, it was one of like the three VHS tapes, you know, not like purchased VHS, like recorded right. like the full Monty. And I think Elliot confidential was on the same tape. Um, and I, uh, we just watch it all the time. It was very much a feel good movie, like, you know, a go-to movie for me. I'm fascinated by the way people found this film because I was older. I was, I was a working critic already. So I think I was, uh, 29 when it came out. I maybe just turned 29. And I kind of understood the pitch as this is like, what if Ken Loach made a populist film? Like that was, that was how they <laughs> sold it to us. The, the local publicists in, in Toronto were right. saying, okay, yes, it's, it's about male strippers, but it's kind of not. And then you get there and it's like, oh, it's economic anxiety and it's, it's working class versus, you know, the, the expectations of what Britishness is. And this this constant chatter of kitchen sink realism colliding with something sort of gently surreal, like the scene where they all dance quietly in the lime to uh, to hot stuff. And yeah, it's character driven, right? Like before anything else, above all, it's about who they are before they decide to do this. And it, it's smack in the pocket of that little wave of eccentric English folk or British folk, depending on where it was made, like Waking Ned Divine and uh, a dozen other films that followed in in the wake of that and The Full Monty, which were these left field (laughs) massive, like The Full Monty made a quarter of a billion dollars worldwide, which what I know it stuns me even now. It stuns me. In 1997. um, That's insane. Like it had a shot at, it's very good. Yeah. And like, this is the same year Titanic came out and obliterated everything else, but it was a, like Titanic was a studio picture. This was a, a scrappy film that was produced. Like it was, it was nurtured at Channel Four. It was going to be a television movie, and then Channel Four, having uh, cultivated, commissioned the script. I don't know what the, the proper term was, but they put it through pre-production and development, and then they just didn't make it. And so Fox Searchlight picked up the whole thing, but it came out of nowhere. Titanic, you could see coming as a right. big hit. This was the defining sleeper of the second half of the 90s, I think. Yeah, I think I'm trying to remember exactly how I got to it. Um, It was at a point in my life when I was very into going into the city 
um, I, live, I grew up outside New York City and I would, my friends and I, well, one friend and I would take the train in and we'd always go to like the Lincoln Plaza Cinema or the Angelica. Right. And we sure. knew those two theaters. Um, you know, uh, I remember, you know, one day it was a snow day from school and we went in and saw Fargo and, you know, <laughs> we'd go in and see every, yeah, it was perfect. Um, and we'd go in and see everything. So there were, I remember, I think I would always look at what was playing at those theaters. And I would always try to see, you know, when we could go in, we try to see them. And sometimes we'd catch, try to make double headers out of it because, you know, it was a trek into the city. Um, but the other thing I sort of remember about this period when I saw it is like, I started having a little bit of brand awareness and I was very yeah. aware of Fox Searchlight as making movies that I was enjoying to see or trying to see. And like when Fox Searchlight made a movie, I would almost try to spot it out um, because otherwise I, you know, I mean, I knew Robert Carlyle as the asshole from Train Spotting. Like yeah. that was like, you know, and I didn't really know what to expect from that um, to going in. Um, and I remember seeing it, it was so interesting to see this guy who he is kind of a dick at first in the movie. <laughs> you know, he's a little selfish, but like to see that character and play him someone who's so desperate to just connect with his son and having no idea how to do it. Um, I found it, I found it so emotionally resonant. And then like all the stuff with um, Mark Addy, you yeah. know, I think I became like a huge Mark Addy stan after this movie. <laughs> and like, I would be like searching movies out with him. Like, I'd be like, Oh my God, Mark Addy's in this movie. I have to see it, which was very weird. But like the scene between him and his wife at the end, you know, when she sort of, tells him like his body she loves his body and like so much of his insecurity comes from like his in inside and himself uh oh god i think it like broke my 17 year old heart it, and it arrived at a point when masculinity was going through all that iron john horse shit too right like the yeah. idea that you needed to be um a specific type of man this yeah this couldn't have landed at a better moment and and even in england i mean that would happen later the like that weird snap towards the david beckham thing where you know jim mm -hmm. rats and reality tv and big brother would would be transplanted over there as well and be just as much of a problem for the for the national self image but mark addy is like carlisle's the outlier mark addy looks like an average english person for 1997 right. like he's not morbidly obese but he's unhealthy and yes. and relatable and self-aware are the two things that he brings to the to the package that that make that character so interesting and so like yeah he it's exactly what you said he's only tragic in his own mind mm -hmm. um and that thing the the dumbest most basic log line right is it's what's inside that counts for any film about people struggling to better themselves or, or reinvent themselves or challenge themselves, but the full Monty makes it literal by focusing on the body. And so you have this really high level of, of meta commentary or self-awareness in the film that the characters come to possess. And so we get to root for them on their little journeys to just to be honest, just to be truthful. Um, Gaz has to talk to his kid and find a way to use his own words. Um, I've forgotten Tom Wilkinson's character's name. Gerald. Thank you, Gerald Arthur Cooper, yes. Uh, it, Gerald has to tell the truth, um, which is, of course, a, an admission that he isn't who he, he claims to be and his whole his whole persona of, of competent self-image. But like, the fact that he can't even tell his wife he lost his job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, so hard for him you know, just to have that in his relationship, you know, he doesn't trust her. It's yeah. his self image. They're, these men are all confronting their self image in a way that is done, you know, but what I, I think why it works so well is it does it in a, it's not like hitting you over the head and like, woe is me vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, this is like, I think you can reach audiences and connect with people if you give them something to root for um and be a little broader you know like ken loach movies are amazing but they're they can be hard watches oh yeah yeah no they're they're you not know? there to entertain you ever no <laughs> and i and i love what he does but great movies it's just a different thing but like this allows you to 
understand these themes while being entertained. And I think people then become more empathetic to the issues that this film is dealing with uh, in such a direct way. Oh, yeah. You lure them in with the naughtiness, right? Like the idea that these oh manly men are going to have to get comfortable with themselves. And then you sit down and within five minutes, like that is not what this movie is about. I mean, watching the trailer is an education in marketing because it's not quite as... Um, outwardly deceptive as those Miramax trailers where they never let the actors speak because then you'd have to accept that the film was in a foreign language and you'd use subtitles. <laughs> They're like two and a half minutes of vistas and Johnny Depp looking up at something while Penelope Cruz, well, actually that one was in English, it's a bad example, but there are hundreds yeah, I know, of them. I know exactly hundreds what of them. you mean. Yeah, and the full Monty is more about, it's an it's silly that these, yeah. these blokes are gonna have to do that. And yet it still plays fair. I think it's, it's disingenuous, but it's not deceptive. And seeing it with an audience that had no idea what it was about, and you know, they saw the poster coming in. This would have been a press right. preview with a, like a radio audience where people won tickets and showed up on a Wednesday night to this tiny theater and not knowing anything about what they were going to see. And yeah, someone did say, "Oh, that's that's the guy from Train Spotting," and because <laughs> people talk in movies. And um, then gradually listening to them just sort of get into it and laugh and, and start to really cheer and applaud in a way that just, I mean, this is 25 years ago. It doesn't happen now, but it didn't happen then that often. And it was so great. You, you feel, and that's the other thing too, this film playing for North American audiences, you feel like you're discovering it. Um, yes. That, that also gets hundred percent. And like that opening thing where it's just like, you think you're going into this movie about dudes like stripping and you get like a 30 second history of Sheffield. Yeah like newsreel footage and it's just like it was it's so an unexpected way in to this story but it sets the tone and sets what we are going to be dealing with in such an it's it's such effective filmmaking i mean the way it uh peter Cataneo directs it is just um he's there with the characters you know he's not it's not precious it's not anything you know, he's not doing fancy camera moves. It's like he's following the characters in the story and almost letting us feel like we're right in the ground with them and experiencing everything with them. And um, I think that sort of style, you know, that doesn't necessarily like embrace like, you know, vistas or beauty or very, you know, crazy cool camera work that doesn't draw attention to itself um, really worked for this film. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to be mundane, right? Like if you if you do anything to make it look, maybe not even like I was going to say sexy, but that's not even how you, you can't make Sheffield. Well, that's not fair. You can make Sheffield look sexy. You just have to light it really well. But this is the plunk you down in the middle of the world and just let you figure out what the air feels like kind of filmmaking, where if you do draw attention to any aspect of it, if there's a shiny car or, you know, if the if the if the production in the in the dance sequences is too polished you'll lose yeah. us like we won't believe it anymore because the whole thing is based on our acceptance that there is nothing for these guys to have like they don't have right. any resources there 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 is no talent pool they are the talent pool which is that whole thing about british cinema loving the underdog story where you know like they get to use proper british gumption and pull themselves up gumption is the wrong word but there is like the british spirit it's it's the story they tell themselves about world war ii and in that case it was true and now it's like metastasized into this nativist weirdness around brexit and proper british things for proper british people and it's horrifying how how instantly it goes to racism and and, and isolationism but this was a point where you could still use that myth and and do something empowering with it. I mean, it is a pretty white movie, um, yes. with one with one notable exception. And even then, yes. it's sort of kind of coded in a in a mildly unpleasant in a way. way. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, it was interesting about what you were saying in those characters. Is that way that they would rather take their clothes off and do this thing, this one time thing, than go work at a local store, like just go do something that didn't value that they felt like didn't give them any value like being yeah. the security guard or working you know as a greeter at whatever that i don't know it's like a wall it's like a british walmart i guess yeah. kind of thing was it an asta might have been an asta but maybe asta yeah that sounds right but it's like that to them was like the work it's better to be unemployed than to do something that doesn't value you um and that sense of like feeling unvalued and trying to sort of create is so uh 
embedded in this story. And it's about these men trying to search for value. And I, I think that's something that is, you know, as you're saying, like continues to be an issue, you know, and it's now it's metastasized in a way that, as you say, is very, you know, gross. Um, but I think there's still an underlying question that hasn't been answered. And that's why we've allowed it to metastasize in this way. We haven't had an alternative, I don't think, that convinces or that compels, right? Like the 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 binary of you must be a man versus mm-hmm. literally any other interpretation right. is it's kind of obscene, but it's so deeply ingrained in in societal mechanics and dynamics that I mean, there's a, there's a television series sequel. Did you know about this? I've only just discovered it. There is a full Monty I sequel. I only know about it. I heard about it. Um, I have not watched it. I'm no, very, I... I'm very wary of sequ- like these sequel type things. I like Lonesome Dove is one of my absolute favorite books. I've read mm-hmm. it like billions of times. And then I read the sequel, I think, which is Streets of Laredo. And what Larry McMurtry does in the first like three pages is he like, either kills or just gets rid of ev- all the characters in Lonesome Dove because except for like three he wants to focus on. And I always like that experience of that book like sort of colors my experience of Lonesome Dove because I Lonesome Dove ends in this way that is very like, where is it going to, you know, there's questions and vibes and it's, I don't know what's going to happen, but the, I can dream, I can think about it, but like reading yeah. that sequel, which is a good story in and of itself, kind of colored the original for me and I'm, I sometimes like to just leave stories where they are. Hey, it's Norm interrupting my own show to bring you up to speed on Shiny Things, my newsletter about physical media, culture, and the odd streaming project. Most recently, I dug into Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and looked at the new 4K releases of Rio Bravo, East of Eden, Enter the Dragon, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Sign up for a 14-day free trial at shiny-things.ghost.io or find a link in the SEMcast Twitter account. You like reading about movies? I like writing about them. Come check it out. I'm curious now mostly because I'd love to see how they're dealing with that masculinity question and and how you address it in post-Brexit England, Uh, if you even can in the same way. Although as, as a you know, as a Hulu Disney series, it probably isn't going to go there just because that's not where they think the audience interest lies. That's the other problem with reboots and, and requels and pickups, right? Like you just have to aim for the audience that wants more of the thing they wanted where that might not be the right thing they need. Right. And they're just going to find a way to get them to do it again. Yeah. How else yeah. do you do this? How do you, you know, we need the stripping. That's the thing people think they remember the most, but what you right. remember are the relationships and, and the, and the effort that it takes for these men to come out of their shells and to, to realize their best selves, even if they don't know they're doing it. It's, um, right. it's kind of incredible. And yeah, as you say, like people who just thought of Carlisle as the hard man, as Begbie from train spotting, He's so, and this apparently is much closer to who he really is. Um, I Really? Yeah, I had Carly Stone on the podcast recently. She's got a new film, North of Normal, that he's in. He lives in Vancouver now. He just, he loved it so much working on the Disney show on Once Upon a Time that he moved his family there and he's raising them on the coast. And he makes movies in Vancouver. And he is apparently just this sweet, gentle, caring collaborative performer who worked really closely with the kid actors they had and made sure they were comfortable and... This is so gratifying to hear that after 30 years in the business that he's not just, he didn't lean into the thing people wanted from him, that he just made his own right. path and, and stayed true to himself. But here too, like That's you, lovely. You, you, he contained so much vulnerability and self-consciousness in his frame. And even when he's enthusiastic, it doesn't quite reach his eyes. You can sort of see the desperation and it's an amazing performance. It's an incredible performance. Um, you know, you can, the, as you said, the desperation just is everywhere in his, like, he wants this so badly and he just doesn't know where he exists in this space, in this world. And mm-hmm. it's, he's been replaced in his family. He's lost his job. Like he just, he's sort of, he, is, I mean, he's desperate in every way of his life. And there's so many moments I forgot, I forget how many, but like, where just the kid just leaves them. And they're always, he's always chasing after Nathan, you yeah. know, Nathan's walking home. Nathan leaves them when they drop the girder in the water. Nathan leaves them when they're doing the strip tease. Day. Like he's embar- like, he's so ashamed in all those little moments. And it, it just, 
you can feel all the paper cuts that have just got him to this point. Um, and, but it hasn't made him like want to be a father any less. Yeah, that's the rule. I think more than anything else, that's the rule he clings to for himself because his job no longer factors in and his marriage is over, but he has his son. He can he can see that path in front of him. And th I guess that's the other reason I would be curious to check in on the reboot and just see how they're handling Carlisle. But at the same time, I just, yeah, I'd rather just leave it in the past where it was. That, that last shot is triumphant and there's no point in going any further. Yeah, I mean, because honestly, it's like, you know, if you start going past that, you're like, all right, well, let's see. They were mapping it. You know, you do the math. They're making 10,000 quid or whatever it was their math was, you know, yeah. and they're splitting 50% with, you You know, it's like, it's not going to get them that far. You know, no. it's a temporary triumph. It's a personal triumph. You know, what starts out as this financial thing becomes this personal triumph. And, you know, I'd probably wager money like in this show that like it's seen as a joke, you know, and people who were there remember it as a joke. You know what I mean? But it's like, it's gonna, they're going to have to, they're going to have to bring them down to bring them up again. Yeah. And I, I want to see, I want to leave them on the path up. I just, that, that yes. idea that this is the moment where yeah, it won't last, but everything's going to be okay. Like the, the, right. the, it's David Kep's dictum. He'd rather leave people on the potential of happiness in a script than it showing a happy ending. You want them to still have to put in the work to keep it. Right. To earn the rest of their lives. And anything someone writes is going to be less satisfying because it's going to be, it's going to have to have exposition about, Hey, remember the thing we did? And it's like, yeah, okay. You wouldn't talk about You're that right. with your friends. They all did it with you. They were there. Like that's, it's like yes. <laughs> the, the shared language where you don't rehash every, because if that is their defining moment, if 25 years later, that's the thing they're clinging to, that's worse. <laughs> I know it's awful. It's awful to think about. God, this conversation is making me not want to watch that even more, which is mm. sad. Uh, wow. but yeah, no, I mean, like it's supposed to be what also they do is they have the entire town there, right? It's like everyone in Sheffield, their entire community is there. It's like this community event and they're not there. What I love is no one's really there to make fun of them. They're just kind of there because everyone has seen this thing and they can't believe these dudes are going through with this. And are they really going to do it? And they want to be there to say that they were there. Right. Like they yeah. want to be there because this is like a moment for this community. You know, this is a moment that's like the police officers are there who arrested them. Like the band is there. Like everyone is there. It's like, it's not about shame. It's about like, hey, we're a community that doesn't have anything. And these five dudes, by taking off their clothes in this club, are going to like give us something, right? That we can like laugh about and enjoy and be part of and be proud of, you know? And it's, it's, so important like that whole sort of set i think would be taken away by a sequel but what do i know it might be amazing yeah the only the other thing that keeps me that keeps tugging at the back of my mind is that simon Beaufort did come back to write it so maybe yeah. but uh, yeah and there there is no greater metaphor either for that what you just described giving the giving something to the community they are literally giving them all they have like they have they're taking their clothes off their backs to entertain <laughs> these people. And that's probably part of it too. Like the general sense that this is some kind of collective sacrifice for the greater good, where, you know, like at the end of this performance, you, we will have less than you have here in this bar right now. And yes. you will applaud us. And, and this, <laughs> this kind of expiation of the flesh, like I'm sure there's some weird Catholic reading or CV reading that I'm not aware of having no history for it, but it just feels like it's got resonance that goes beyond the gesture. And maybe that's why it caught on in such a huge, huge way, because you are invited to be part of the, the cheering crowd, not the people who are mocking them. I mean, there really isn't anyone left to mock them by the end of it. Yeah. And even the people who are mocking them, they're kind of like, it's quick. It's like a guy, it's a cat collar or something on the street more so. Like the people <laughs> they encounter tend to just be like, what are you thinking? Or like, you call this being a good parent, you know? But like everyone... They, <sighs> Oh, it's that attempt to shame, right? Like that reflects it, which is very British as well. Like the, the immediate, oh, what will people think response? Yes. I have I have English relatives. I get it. But the <laughs> um, the sense that, you know, like there are things that are not done. There are things that are not proper. And that also allows a society to continue functioning while denying all the 
It's not even perversion and deviation. It's just the fact that people do take their clothes off and have you know, touchy times with people. Um, and right. England, you know, ever since Victoria has just dis- depended on not acknowledging that. And then suddenly, you know, the full Monty was sort of the, like the first crack in that particular barrier, because then there's this flood of cheeky nude, well, I mean, like Benny Hill was as close as they got. There were the carry on films right. where they couldn't really, no one was actually allowed to do anything, but they could just make it disturbing and creepy innuendos and leer at each other and right. here it's just like no people take you know like people have penises this is this is the story of these guys who are going to do that right. and then from there you get this other weird explosion of of like rampant sexuality is happening at the same time with the spice girls exploiting themselves but it's all empowerment like it's all say what you will about the the music industry and, and the and the, the way it feeds on young attractive women but but the spice girls at least made us believe that they were into it and the full Monty 100%. is the dude version of that, which is such a weird thing for me to suddenly realize 25 years later. <laughs> but that's what's great about this movie. It totally holds up. I remember mm. like I, I, my wife had never seen it. And I guess maybe sometime in the past, sometime six, eight months ago or something, I was like, we want to do a movie night. And I was like, let's watch the full Monty. And she was like cheering along, laughing along, absolutely just loved it, you know? Oh, wow. And it totally... Yeah, I mean, I think we've become more cynical and darker uh, in some ways, but the sense, the desperation, the joy, and the hope that really infuse this movie and the characterizations, they just, they still reach your heart. And that's like undeniable. It is. It's so damn charming. Yeah. Uh, and weirdly enough, this does let me connect this to to your work, to Aporia, specifically because if you didn't have Judy Greer as your hero, I think the film would be very, very different. And I will always have a rooting interest for her. She's one of the nicest people I've ever met. She's a knitter. She knows my wife's work. Um, but this is this is the kind of role that she rarely gets to play. She is like both the emotional and moral conscience of your entire universe. And she's so good at finding those little holes in, in moments where, you know, you can see her temptation or you can see her her anguish, but the humanity of it is the humanity of her performance is what grounds your film on a level that I didn't, I'm not sure anyone else could have grounded it. And it's, it's, it's a remarkable performance and the, the movie's good, but um, the concept is really interesting and rife with potential, but she plays every single one of those moments on her face, on her skin. And yeah, she makes it, she makes yeah. a concept human. Judy is, um, such a talent and she is the type of actor who I um who I wanted for this role I mean she was the, she was such a dream uh get for me it was I've been a huge huge fan of her for years um because she is so expressive in her face and able to just find the little bits of emotion you know in the smallest details and um you know, so much of her, her faith, I think is allowed, she's very funny as a human being, but even beyond that, her expressiveness has been very easily used for comedy, which is why she's always sort of the number two or, you know, off to the side. And these, um, but then you have movies like The Descendants or even The Halloween, where she comes in and uh, she brings so much more to these characters. And finding the right Sophie for me was the key because this movie lives and dies on her character and her choices. And you have to be rooting for her and you have to believe in her and you have to understand the maelstrom of emotion that is sort of going through her at every moment in this story. Um, and, you know, when Judy read the script and responded, I was like over the joy, no, overjoyed. I was so excited to sit down with her and talk to her about it. Um, and she and I like went through it you know, page by page talking about what she was feeling, what she was, you know, and the different feelings and which emotion we both thought would be the, you know, would be the more powerful one at this moment, or maybe, you know, where, you know, she'd go from feeling angry to feeling, you know, more morally guilty to feeling sad, you know, and um, crafting this character who uh, has to be true to both of us. If it's going to be true, she's going to be true to the audience. Yeah. And in the same way as having, someone like Robert Carlyle in the lead of the full Monty, you have someone whose presence destabilizes the concept, right? Like this is not the person I expected to be in this situation. Wow. That's cool. 
Well, you actors, I think certain actors at least can bring who they are to the role. And, you know, Robert Carlyle brought Begbie to this role. And, you know, Judy brings, you know, two decades of being the supporting best friend character, right? And I think part of what I wanted to do with this movie is like, all right, let's, you know, it's a movie that takes place in a neighborhood that you wouldn't look at twice when you were cutting through that you probably don't even know existed. And it's the most powerful machine in the world and it looks like a fire hazard. <laughs> and, you know, it's in a yeah. building that is just like, you know, not in great condition. It's got garbage out front. And Judy is sort of the character. It's like, we're turning the camera on places that you don't expect to be turning the camera. And turning it on Judy is part of that decision. Oh yeah, because you know, no. she isn't who you expect to find in the lead. And I act, but I really hope um, after this, you know, we have she has this movie, and then she has Michael Shannon's movie. And I just, I hope, and I pray, and I think, you know, we should be entering like a period where Judy's going to be the center of attention. You know, she's going to be lead. So we're going, you know, let's get a Judy sans going. Oh yeah, if there's anything I can do to make that happen. Um, and then finally, because we're just about to run out of time, the uh, the last question on the podcast is always. If there is something, I can't see how other than the stuff we just discussed, but um, if there's anything of the full Monty that you have borrowed or stolen outright or quoted or, or homaged or found a way to work into your own stuff, do, do you look back and see its influence somewhere? I mean, I don't I do. see, I see. It's interesting. I see its influence in two ways. First is that like, I'm, I realized parenthood has infused pretty much all my films, even before I became a parent. Um, I was just working on an essay thinking about this and I realized, um, you know, from Dead Man's Burden, my first film, which literally opens with a daughter shooting her own father to The Ballad of Lefty Brown, which has a real, you know, it's a coming of age story for a 63 year old cowboy that hinges <laughs> on, you know, Bill Pullman being, you know, sort of like the son to, you know, not literal son, but, you know, emotional son to Edward uh, Johnson and Peter Fonda and stepping out from that shadow. Part of how he does it is becoming a father figure to a, another person. You know, Aporia is about, you know, parenthood is so important. It's something that I think infuses it. And I think it, the full Monty spoke to me in that way. And I don't think I quite realized how much it spoke to me as a creator. Um, but I think it infuses my work and the way they handle those relationships as a parent. And then also just like what we were talking about, just being plopped into that world. You know, the way it just like, Sheffield is a character in that movie. And I really like just plopping, you know, land and place is really important to me as a filmmaker and in Aporia, especially that sort of, we're just plopping in this world. And these aren't people who you really, you know, these aren't rich Beverly Hills people who, you know, have every resource in the world. It's people just sort of living their life day to day, hand to mouth. Um, and that to me feels sort of, I think, uh, inspired even on a, you know, about by the full Monty a little bit. My thanks to Jared Moshe, whose new film, Aporia, is in theaters across North America this Friday, August 11th. Thanks also to Anna Salvini. She knows what she did. You can find Jared on Twitter at Jared Moshe, all one word, and you can find The Full Monty on Blu-ray and DVD from 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment. It's also streaming on Disney Plus in Canada and on Hulu, Max, and DirecTV in the U.S., and available to rent or buy on various VOD services. For the next little while, at least, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, Although, look for me on Blue Sky. And you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for just 20 bucks at payhep.com slash Semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of Someone Else's Movie, 44 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by the last year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe, watch movies, wear a mask if you go out, get your booster when you can. I'll see you next week.